Curiosity is part of human nature. Thankfully, there are countless unsolved mysteries still awaiting answers for us to remain curious about. Some of these mysteries may never get answers, but our curiosity can come up with new theories to explore and new leads to follow. Hopefully, that will one day lead to at least some of these mysteries being solved. Number 5. In 1989, the U.S. Navy picked up an unusual noise coming from the ocean off the northwest coast. They initially feared it might have been a submarine from an enemy nation. It was something much more unusual and remains shrouded in mystery to this day. It didn't take the Navy long to figure out this wasn't a submarine or anything man-made. It sounded like a long, extremely low-frequency, sad moan. It was close to a whale song but unlike any of them they'd ever heard before. At the end of the Cold War, information about this sound was given to scientists to see if they could figure it out. It was heard periodically in the Northeast Pacific Ocean between the months of August and December. Around January, the source of the noise moved out of range of the underwater microphones that scientists were using to detect the noise. By 1992, scientists had figured out this wasn't just close to a whale song, it was one. It was sung at 52 hertz, not far above the limit of human hearing, but it was completely unique. Each different type of whale sings at a different frequency. Blue whales sing somewhere between the range of 10 to 39 hertz, a much deeper range than that of this mystery creature. Fin whales also vocalize at a much deeper range. There are whales that make noises in the range of 52 hertz. For example, the gray whale has many different types of vocalizations, and one of these typically falls within the 51 to 185 hertz range. But this is described as a pulsing noise rather than the long, low sound heard by the hydrophones. What scientists were hearing wasn't a pulse or knocking sound, but a stereotypical whale song at the wrong pitch. There were some other differences between the 52 hertz whale song and a normal whale song. Its patterns of repetition were shorter and more unpredictable. It wasn't only the noise that made this creature stand out. Using the underwater microphones, scientists could track its movements when it was in range. They could see that the migration pattern resembled that of a blue whale, which travels from Alaska down to the southern tip of Baja, California each year. But the season that migration took place more closely resembled the migration of fin whales. All the evidence that could be gathered using the underwater microphones only left scientists with more questions than answers. There was one major problem with solving this mystery. The creature that was creating the noise had never been tracked down. Whales can dive to a depth much deeper than any man-made object can get down to, and monitoring them is extremely difficult. For years, scientists studying blue whales have had difficulty tracking the animals. At the moment, the best way of doing this is through satellites. The fact that whales generally travel together would make them easier to see from space than one individual whale by itself. Scientists do believe the 52 hertz whale is by itself. Other whale species would be able to hear it, but it's possible they're unable to understand it. It might even be a scary noise to them. Coming across a human that communicated in unpredictable patterns at a pitch twice as high as a normal human's range would definitely seem very creepy to us. As well as this, scientists were able to detect that there weren't any other whales vocalizing in the area of the 52 hertz whale, confirming this theory. Tracking down this individual creature would be harder than tracking down a typical whale, but that hasn't stopped people from trying. One documentary maker set out to find the whale, but the search was unsuccessful. With only its song as evidence, scientists have put forward a few theories about why this whale is so unique. One theory is that it's a hybrid between a blue whale and a fin whale. Blue whales are relatively rare due to centuries of hunting by humans, and it's not unheard of for these whales to reproduce with fin whales. The 52 hertz whale has characteristics of each species, which might be due to it being a combination of the two. But that wouldn't explain why it's such a unique specimen, given there are other examples of hybrid blue and fin whales. Another theory put forward is that it was sick in some way. But the whale has survived for over 30 years, which means that this is unlikely to be the answer. It could still have a deformity of some kind or be deaf, 
but as whales use sound for navigation as well as communication, the possibility that the whale is deaf is also unlikely. Until the 52 Hz whale, or 52 blue as it's sometimes called, is finally found, scientists won't be able to figure out why it's so unique. But a recent discovery indicated that it might not be as unique as it first seemed. In 2021, documentary makers revealed that they'd picked up a second whale singing at the same range as 52 Blue. The news was celebrated, but it also raised even more questions. We don't know where the second whale had been, if this is a new young whale that's developed this unique trait, or if it's simply been out of range of microphones for the past 30 years. It could be that there are many whales that sing at this frequency, but in an unknown area of the ocean. The Pacific Ocean is one of the least explored places on the planet, as this new discovery proved. But it's also possible that our exploration of the oceans is what caused the 52 blue phenomenon in the first place. With the increase in maritime traffic, underwater drilling, and the use of sonar, the ocean has become much noisier in recent decades. This might be having an impact on the hearing and vocalization of species that rely on sound for navigation as they travel in the water. We don't know for certain if humans are responsible for this strange phenomenon, and it won't be until 52 Blue or a similar specimen is located that we'll be able to rule it out for certain. Number 4. Real-world heists have been inspiring filmmakers for decades. When one is pulled off without anybody being hurt and without the culprits being found, it can almost be endearing to the public and moviegoers who see this small group of criminals going up against some major corporation and the authorities. In India, the heist that perfectly encapsulated that spirit was the 1987 Opera House heist. At around 2.15 p.m. on March 19, 1987, a private bus pulled up outside expensive jewelers in the Opera House area of Mumbai. This was where the city's most exclusive jewelry stores were located, and only the wealthiest shopped. The store itself was called TBZ and was a standout even in this location for its prestige. Its motto was, where trust is a tradition. The irony of this would be pointed out in news reports after the incident. Twenty-six young men got off the bus, dressed as officers from the Central Bureau of Investigation, and led by an older man in a three-piece suit. He introduced himself to the store's owner as Mohan Singh from the Research and Analysis Wing, informed the owner that this was a raid. There had been reports of low-quality gold sold at the store, and they needed to confiscate items for examination. Despite the prestigious location, this wasn't the first time that TBZ had been raided by the CBI. The store's owner, Pratap Saveri, had been present at multiple raids and wasn't surprised by the actions of Singh and his team. He had a warrant and went through the typical procedure in such a raid. The CCTV was turned off. The weapon that Zaveri was licensed to carry was handed over. The store's shutters were closed, and a board was placed outside, indicating that a raid had taken place. After the scene was secured, the raid took place. Money was confiscated from the cash register, and Singh selected samples of jewelry to be taken. These were placed in individual bags with slips of paper that had the government seal on them. He instructed the officers to take briefcases containing money and hand the weapon to the bus. Then, Singh claimed he had to go check on another raid. He would take the jewelry with him, but said he would return and collect his men afterward. They were to stand guard until he returned. It was only at this point that Zaveri realized not everything was as it seemed. Normally, at the end of a raid, the CBI would give him a receipt to prove what had happened, but Singh offered no such receipt. When he was gone, his young officers stood guard, but they didn't seem to know what they were doing. An hour passed and there was no sign of Singh. At this point, Zaveri contacted the police, who had no idea that a CBI raid was taking place. The police arrived to find a group of confused young men dressed as CBI officers. They informed the police that they were taking part in a mock raid as part of a recruitment process that they had started the day before. The advert had appeared in the Times of India two days earlier. It read, Wanted. 50 dynamic graduates for intelligence officers post and security officers post. Come personally for an interview with biodata, certificates, and passport size photo on March 18, 1987 at Taj Intercontinental Hotel inquiry counter between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. These men had all answered the advertisement. 
The roles being advertised were prestigious enough that some people already working in government jobs had arrived to interview for them. The Taj Intercontinental also gave the advertisement an air of legitimacy. This was one of the most luxurious hotels in the area. When applicants arrived, they were told to go to a nearby building. The person who placed the advertisement, Mohan Singh, was staying at the hotel, but they hadn't given him permission to hold interviews there. That didn't deter many applicants, and dozens of young men arrived at this second location to take part in interviews. At the end of the day, Singh selected 26 people who would go through to the next stage of the recruitment process. They would show up the following day to take part in a mock raid. Singh had hired the bus through the hotel. When the recruits arrived on the morning of the raid, they were each given official-looking CBI badges and instructed on what to do during the raid. Singh seemed to have had detailed knowledge of how the CBI operated, and nobody suspected anything was wrong. That was until the police arrived after the raid took place. The police went to the hotel to try to track down Singh, but he'd already absconded. He had taken the bus back to the hotel, then hired a taxi towards Vile Parle. According to reports, he was seen on an auto rickshaw in the area, carrying the briefcase, an attache case, and a gunny bag. He'd even given an address to the hotel. It was a location in Trivendum, which matched his southern accent. But when the police arrived at the address given, they found nobody living there. The case quickly went cold. None of the would-be recruits could provide any information about C. They'd been as fooled by him as the store owner had been. Between 23 and 35 lakh had been stolen in jewelry and cash. That would be the equivalent of roughly 550,000 US dollars. The police had no leads to follow. It was as if Singh had disappeared into thin air. Gang informants were contacted to see if they had any information on this mysterious individual, but it seemed that this robbery had nothing to do with any known gang. There was still one hope that the police held on to. Often, the only way some of the cleverest criminals are caught is when they try to pull the same heist twice. They waited for any sign that something similar would take place, but apparently this mysterious criminal wasn't going to be greedy. He had enough money to retire and decided to not try pulling the same stunt twice. Amazingly, the police had almost caught him before the heist ever took place. In October of 1986, there had been a similar advertisement in the newspaper, again asking would-be recruits to arrive at the Taj. 150 people showed up, but there was no sign of the person who organized it. The CBI had spotted the advertisement and had gone to investigate, but apparently the mastermind had been tipped off. This led to a new theory. Given the fact that the criminal seemed to have a lot of knowledge about CBI practices, he was theorized that he might have been a disgruntled CBI agent. But going through employee records, there were no obvious suspects. Either he'd gotten his CBI knowledge from elsewhere, or he had managed to fly under the radar while continuing to work at the organization he just impersonated. Decades later, the case remains unsolved. It inspired a Bollywood film, Special 26, named after the nickname that Singh apparently gave to the recruits that made it through the interview stage. The film renewed interest in the heist, but no progress has been made since Singh disappeared into thin air more than 30 years ago. It's unlikely this strange mystery will ever be solved, unless the person responsible finally reveals himself after all these years. Number 3. The most famous depictions of the British Admiral Horatio Nelson show him with a peculiar-looking ornament on his hat. This was a specially made kalink bestowed upon him by Sultan Selim III and one of Nelson's most prized possessions. A little over a hundred years after he passed, it was donated to the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich to be put on display. In 1951, the kalink was stolen and has never been seen since. While the Battle of Trafalgar may be the one that Nelson was most famous for, Many historians see the Battle of the Nile as Nelson's finest hour. This was his first time commanding a fleet in action, though he'd already claimed glory in other battles. His aim had been to capture or destroy the French fleet that was supplying Napoleon's army, but the ships had proven elusive. As Nelson was sailing around the Mediterranean in search of the French, Napoleon's occupation of Egypt had turned violent, and Muslim rulers elsewhere in the Ottoman Empire were calling for aid in getting rid of him. 
On August 1, 1798, Nelson and his fleet finally caught up with the French in Aboukir Bay. There were 13 ships in the bay, all chained together, but Nelson's fleet was able to slip through between the last ship and the harbor. Once on their unprotected side, the battle commenced. It was a disaster for the French army. Their flagship, L'Oréal, was destroyed in a spectacular manner and left thousands of French soldiers in the water fighting for their lives. The British lost a few hundred soldiers and Nelson himself was wounded, but it was a resounding victory. By the end of the battle, 11 of the 13 French ships that were in the bay were either captured or destroyed. After recovering from his wound, Nelson sent word of his victory to England, as well as other parts of the continent. It wasn't long before the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire heard news of the defeat and sent many treasures as gifts to Nelson. Among those were gold sequins to be given to those who were wounded in battle, ceremonial weapons, and a box of jewels. The most impressive gift was the kalink, or the plume of victory. According to the story that came with the gift, when Sultan Selim had heard of Nelson's victory, he had taken the brooch from his turban to be given to the admiral. It was the highest honor that could be given to a non-Muslim, and the first time a kalink had been gifted to someone not of that faith. The award was so impressive that it had allegedly upset some of the Sultan's own admirals, and they felt snubbed. Even without knowing how symbolic the brooch was, it was clearly impressive. It had a large central diamond set on a watch mechanism that caused it to rotate slowly. Coming out from the top of the brooch were 13 sprays, which contained a combined 40 perfectly matching Brazilian diamonds. According to some versions of the story, it was just a coincidence that this brooch had 13 sprays, while other versions say that the Sultan ordered for more to be added so that it matched the number of vessels Nelson had captured or sunk during the battle. The Kalink was presented to Nelson in Naples, along with the other gifts. The people bringing the gifts wore state robes and presented the Kalink on a cushion. Nelson was so impressed by the gifts, he contacted King George III in England to ask permission to accept them and wear the Kalink as part of his uniform. Permission was granted and it would become a signature part of Nelson's image. The public's opinion on the Kalink was varied. Some thought it looked strange, but the image of Nelson wearing it on his bicorn hat started a fashion trend in the late 1700s. When Nelson lost his life in the Battle of Trafalgar, the Kalink was inherited by his brother and remained in the family for several generations. By the late 1800s, the family had fallen into financial struggles. In the years since the Admiral had passed away, many precious relics had been sold at auction, and there was a fear that this would also happen with the Kalink. In 1929, the current owners of the Kalink offered to sell it for just 1,500 pounds to the Society of Nautical Research, but raising this money proved difficult. Eventually, Lady Sarita Barclay purchased the Kalink and it was donated to the museum on behalf of her husband. It was placed on display at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, where it would remain until 1951. Just before 2 a.m. on June 11, 1951, alarms began to ring to alert staff that something was wrong in Gallery 10. The police arrived just four minutes later and inherited the gallery. At first, it seemed like nothing was wrong. But when they switched on the light, they found a glass on the floor and a window open. Only one of the display cases had been broken, and only one item had been stolen, the Kalink. The police located two ladders in an annex next to the gallery, and it was determined that this was how the thief or thieves managed to get in. This wasn't the first time historic relics had been stolen from museums, or even the first time that Nelson's relics had been taken. But this incident shocked the nation. The theft was brought up in the House of Parliament, where members in the House of Lords discussed the theft. A reward of £250 was offered for the return of this relic. According to authorities, this was more than the individual jewels that made up the Kalink were worth. While it had a significant, sentimental, and historical value, the individual diamonds were supposedly not of very high quality. If the thief wanted to break it up and sell it, he probably wouldn't get more than £250 being offered. This plan had worked. When metals were stolen, 2,500 pounds were offered for their return, as it was more than the price of the scrap metal. But there was a chance that it had been stolen by a gang that specialized in the sale of historical items to private collectors. It was clear that the Kalink had been the target, and the thief had gone to considerable effort if they only wanted the diamonds alone. 
It was theorized that whoever had taken it would try to get it off the continent or to America, where it would then be sold to a private collector. Alerts were put out to air and seaports to be on the lookout for the item, but unfortunately it was never found. In 1994, there was a break in the case. George Taters Chatham was a notorious criminal who was first convicted for theft in 1931. He was in and out of prison and gained a reputation for his high-profile thefts. Two years before the disappearance of the Calig, he broke into the Victoria and Albert Museum using two ladders to steal a ceremonial weapons that were on display. In 1994, Chatham would confess to doing the same thing at Greenwich. He claimed to have sold the Kalink to a gang for a few thousand pounds and believed that it had been broken up to be sold off. This end wouldn't make a lot of sense if the diamonds in the artifact were of a low quality, as the police believed when the reward was issued. It's possible they were worth more than it's being believed, or this gang simply didn't know the worth that they had. Alternatively, there is hope that it was sold on while still in one piece, and might still be out there today, waiting to be rediscovered. Number 2. There's something about TV hijackings that captures the interest and the imaginations of those who hear about them. People have often talked about how they feel as if presenters are in their homes or directly talking to them when they see them on TV, which could go some way to explain our fascination with these hijackings. It's as if the TV intrusion is an intrusion of our homes. Most of the time, the people behind these TV hijackings are quickly found. There's only a limited area that the signal could be broadcast from, and a small number of people who would have had the equipment and the motive to go ahead with such a broadcast. The few hijackings that go unsolved become legendary in the world of unsolved mysteries. But there's one unsolved broadcast intrusion that remains relatively unknown. The Lucky 7 channel is the first known pirate television channel in US history. It was available for three evenings in Syracuse before vanishing from the airwaves. The hijacking took place in 1978. At that point, most TVs were only able to receive a handful of channels. Sets in Syracuse, New York were no exception. It was possible to set your TV to receive broadcasts at other frequencies, but that would just mean tuning it to static. Channel 7 was one such static channel. But on the evening of April 14th, anybody who accidentally tuned into this channel received something different. The channel was now playing movies and reruns from old sitcoms. Occasionally, between movies, a presenter would be seen on the screen. He was wearing an old-fashioned gas mask, not only making the broadcast incredibly creepy, but also making it impossible to identify him. The presenter told viewers that they were watching Lucky 7. The broadcast ended at around 6 a.m., with the presenter declaring that they'd been able to reach half of Syracuse. Then the station ID played. The graphic showed two dice rolled to seven, with the sound of a female choir singing in the background. Then the channel returned to static. The second broadcast would start at 8 p.m. on April 15th, and this time, Lucky 7 received a lot more attention than it did previously. The presentation followed in the same manner as before. It was mostly old TV shows, but some of the films that were shown were actually relatively new. We don't have a full schedule of what show was broadcast and when, but there is a list of films that were broadcast. The final broadcast would take place on April 16th. It ended at midnight when the gas mask wearing presenter appeared again. The presenter claimed it had been an experiment to see how many people would tune in, and there were plans for a similar channel without any commercials in the future. After this, the static returned, and Lucky 7 went off the air for good. It's not clear when exactly the police became aware of this pirate broadcast. Some sources claim that it wasn't until days after the final broadcast that the authorities were even informed, while others say that they were made aware of the broadcast after the second day. But all of this occurred over a single weekend. It's unlikely that the relevant authorities would have had time to properly begin the investigation before the channel went off the air. Nothing like this has ever happened before in the US. The only significant television broadcast intrusion to have occurred was the famous Southern Television broadcast interruption. That had occurred in the UK in 1977 and only involved an audio interruption. It had lasted minutes rather than the hours that Lucky 7 was on air. As this was so new, it's likely that the authorities were completely unprepared for the investigation. 
With no new broadcasts, the authorities had to work on information that could be gathered from those who had watched the broadcast. Experts claimed that someone who was a little tech-savvy would have been able to construct the pirate station relatively easily. It would have needed a video source, a distribution modulator, and an antenna in a high location. Students from Syracuse University became the main suspects in this case. One of the main draws of the university was its communications department, which would have had access to all three of these items. As well as this, many of the university buildings were located on Mount Olympus, which would have given any antenna a line of sight to a good amount of Syracuse. Further evidence was the fact that the broadcast seemed to be stronger for TVs closer to the university. But the communications department claimed that none of their equipment had been used for this pirate station. One theory was that equipment from the student union's closed-circuit TV station was used for Lucky 7, but a manager there confirmed that no equipment went missing when Lucky 7 was on the air. The idea that university students were behind it seemed to be confirmed by the Syracuse student newspaper, the Daily Orange, which ran an interview with someone alleging to have been part of the broadcast. The anonymous student said they were inspired by pirate radio broadcast and had never realized it would get the level of attention that it did. They also explained that there were between 2 and 25 people involved, and went on to detail about how it was run. According to the student, the transmitter had been made using a guitar amp running at 175 MHz, the frequency of Channel 7. The TV shows and movies broadcast had been recorded using a VCR from traditional channels before the launch of Lucky 7, and then simply played back on this new frequency. Even though only a relatively small number of people would have watched the broadcast, the Lucky 7 TV hijacking made national headlines. The FCC joined the investigation to try to track down the hackers, and warned that the penalty could be a fine of up to $10,000 or a year in prison. But despite the national attention, nobody came forward with information, and the people responsible for Lucky 7 were never caught. The statute of limitations in this crime has since run out, so the people who were responsible for this will never face any punishment for their actions. But that hasn't led to anyone coming forward in recent years. It's possible that the people responsible went on to work in the industry and wouldn't want the truth about this illegal activity to come out. Another added element to this mystery is the fact that there's no footage from the broadcasts. Of course, the movies that were played have been recorded in more official ways, but the editorials from the man in the gas mask have apparently been lost to history. VCRs were commercially available at the time, but they were still rare. Most people who had them rented the devices rather than owning them outright. It's still possible that someone watching this strange broadcast decided to preserve it and has a tape of the mysterious individual hidden away somewhere. It's also possible that the people behind Lucky 7 might have recorded their hijacking. Either way, this remains a piece of lost media that's never been uncovered. Number 1. It seems like every year we learn a little more about our solar system and the universe beyond it. But every new discovery comes with more unanswered questions that puzzle scientists and the public alike. While there are many mysteries in the universe, perhaps one of the strangest objects in our solar system is the planet Uranus. The search for exoplanets has led to the discovery of many strange and unique planets orbiting distant stars. But we don't have to look too far to find something truly bizarre. Uranus was discovered in 1781, not long after its unique tilt was revealed. For most planets in the solar system, the axis that they spin on is almost perpendicular to their orbital plane. They spin in such a way that the Sun rises in the east, or the west in the case of Venus, then it moves across the sky to the west as the planet rotates. Most of the planets have some kind of tilt. The Earth's rotational axis is tilted at a little over 23 degrees from vertical. Jupiter is almost perfectly vertical at just 3 degrees of tilt. Other than Uranus, Saturn has the most tilt, at almost 27 degrees. Uranus's tilt from vertical is almost 98 degrees. That means that it almost looks as if it's rolling along its orbital plane. This means seasons are taken to the extreme, with each pole receiving 42 Earth years of continuous sunlight and 42 years of continuous darkness. Scientists haven't been able to figure out how Uranus's tilt was changed in such an extreme manner. 
We know that Earth's tilt was caused by a collision between our planet and another large object when the Earth was still being formed. For many, this is the best answer for Uranus's tilt mystery, too. In Uranus's case, the object would be roughly the size of Earth and would have to have struck Uranus at a significant speed to knock it from its typical axis. The problem with this theory is that Uranus's rings and moons also orbit on its side. These two would have been knocked over when Uranus's tilt changed. But if an object large enough and moving fast enough to knock Uranus into its current position, then this would have destroyed the rings and knocked out the moons that orbit Uranus. Instead, it could have been caused by two smaller collisions. The other problem with this theory is that most planets would have been hit by objects during the formation of the solar system, but only Uranus's tilt was impacted so drastically. The chances of this happening to just one of the planets seems extremely thin. Another theory suggests that rather than a rogue planet, it was one of Uranus's own moons that caused the tilt. If a large enough moon fell into the planet, this could have caused its tilt. It would have come from within Uranus's system, which meant that the system wouldn't have been destroyed like something coming from outside. But there are other theories. Another theory proposed by scientists in 2009 also blamed a moon for Uranus's tilt, but not one that collided with the planet. Research and modeling have shown that a large enough moon orbiting at a certain distance from Uranus could shift the speed of its precession, which would then cause it to tilt. We know our moon has an impact on our own tilt, keeping it at the level that it is today. Models show that a moon, a hundredth of the mass of Uranus, orbiting at 50 Uranian radii, would be able to cause a significant enough tilt. The problem with this theory is that there isn't a moon of this size, or orbiting at this distance. At least there isn't any more. We know Uranus has changed significantly over time. In the early stages of the solar system's development, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all orbited much closer to Jupiter than they do today. Where exactly Uranus was born is another mystery about this far-off world. But at some point, these planets began to migrate further afield, until they sat where they do today. Computer models proved that during this migration, a moon of a significant enough size to change Uranus's tilt would have been present, only to be thrown out of orbit by the gravitational pull of another gas giant, not long before Uranus reached its present orbit. So far, there's only been one space probe sent to visit Uranus, Voyager 2. That probe spent about 45 hours flying by Uranus. While we gathered a wealth of knowledge during that time, it's still only a small snapshot of the planet, and there's only so much we can figure out about it with the information we have. Solving the mystery of Uranus's tilt could help us better understand exoplanets that might exist as we search for life outside of our solar system. This mystery might also help to solve another of Uranus's mysteries, its strange magnetic field. A planet's magnetic field helps to protect it from energized particles coming from the Sun and elsewhere in space. Uranus's magnetic field is another unique element of this planet. From what we can tell, it's offset from the angle of the planet's rotation by a further 60 degrees. It also doesn't go through the center of the planet, causing a strange wobbling effect. Combined with Uranus's unique spin, it makes the planet extremely difficult to visualize. More significantly, scientists have discovered that, periodically, the magnetic field lines disconnect and reconnect, allowing particles from the Sun to bombard the planet. The cause of this strange magnetic field remains a mystery. It might have something to do with the structure of the planet, another thing we know very little about. We know that it's made up of water, methane, and ammonia, but the states these chemicals are in are less clear. But the planet should have a layer of electrically conducting fluid, called a convection layer. This would be responsible for the magnetic field and whatever's happening to it. Another factor that scientists have to consider when coming up with theories about the magnetic field is whether it's changed in the decades since we last collected data. Changes could rule out some theories, but could make the answer to the strange phenomenon very obvious. These are just a few of the questions scientists have about Uranus. If and when we send another probe to explore the planet, it's possible some of these mysteries might be answered, but it's just as likely that we uncover new questions and mysteries to replace them. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. 
but my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.